Brothers and sisters, I had a period of living for the weekend. <laughs> High on Capitol Hill, like the tracks and houses of Japan, I ran rampant. This was when they had that big flood in Japan. Through flood waters, zombie cars, boats without captains, cars moving sideways, houses pushed off their roots, in the coal cellar, bare-chested women shouting in the rain. In this fever, I skipped my meetings, stopped my medication. Alone in limpid drool, lay I strapped to the table, surfing the wild waters of Mensa Tibang. My steed hit a hoarding. If you bob there, bob there, jolted but steady, saved by a billboard, soaking wet and cold, but alive. I could look up and see the words looming over me in bright fire colors, but no sense of what they were saying. For that, you'd have to be on the other side of the camera. Kevin Ryan told me, everyone's naked on the internet. And Kylie added, we just want tomorrow to be better than today. I think selling comes second. But once the straps are off and I'm being toweled down roughly by a Red Cross nurse, my skin shows me that selling trumps everything. Moloch let me live to be a content provider. <laughs> So speaking of which, <laughs> what did Amazon reviews find you too? <laughs> I read, I'm reading one that was, it's just news to me. I don't remember writing it or anything. <laughs> and it's called Overcoming Shame. And it's my review of the association, Greatest Hits, audio CD. <laughs> Don't you hate when those re don't you hate those reviewers who complain about a greatest hits album? That one obvious song is missing, and yet I'm going to pull a facsimile of that exact review. <laughs> Regarding the greatest hits of the association, I sent away for it just blindly, assuming without reading the fine print. And you know what they say about assuming. <laughs> well, it happened to me. I wanted one song, <laughs> the theme from Goodbye Columbus. And when the CD came, I didn't even look for it. Just thrust the disc into the player and waited. <laughs> and waited and waited. <laughs> Heard a bunch of nice songs, but you know, I said to my kids, I never did hear Goodbye Columbus. <laughs> Neither, Dad. <laughs> Give me that sleeve, I swore. It's actually a beautiful image of the six members of the association grouped, some standing, some sitting or kneeling, on the rich green banks of some magnificent morning lake. They're all pushed to the right side in keeping with the Hudson River School or some fantastic Turner painting like Juliet and her nurse, where it's the landscape, not the incidental human onlookers that matters. In tiny letters, the names of the songs are listed in saffron. Too small for me to read. Kids! I cried out. Do you see the word Columbus anywhere? No, Dad. The truth is that even in their heyday, the association were hard to swallow, especially if you had an ounce of cool in you. <laughs> I became fascinated with their minimalistic procedures towards language, almost on the Aram Saroyan level. <laughs> they would focus in on one word at a time. Windy, perhaps, or cherish, 
And each track would be this close, intense examination of how the word worked, its function in society. The blend of their voices was less jaunty than the Beach Boys. Indeed, it had something of the faceless piety of the Vienna Boys Choir. <laughs> had they reached puberty? Hard to tell. I remember the guilty pleasure of hearing them boom out, Hello, life! Goodbye, Columbus! On the radio waves and delighting in the misery that this iteration must be causing author Philip Roth at, the ver at this very moment. It was like that Preston Sturges film, Sullivan's Travels. He thought he was writing, Oh, brother, where art thou? But the association had rendered his sensitive novella into Ants in Your Pants, 1969. Or Enter the Young. Has there any... Has, has there ever been anything more twee? And yet, and yet, when all is said is done, they had something. Their very awkwardness and sincerity had a moral force, like Luther pounding those proclamations <laughs> into the cathedral door. I did love them, despite never knowing one from the other. <laughs> Despite the cloying sentiments of never my love or everything that touches you, they weren't rock, not exactly. They were like looking at the US flag intently and switching your gaze to a white wall. <laughs> and something like Jasper John's flag pops out at you in yellow and green. Yes, they were like listening to rock and then watching a white wall to see what might develop. <laughs> A meditational exercise like Tai Chi. They're flawless, really. <laughs> I go back to my book, Argento series. I wanted to read it um, in honor of Sarah and her reading because she told me this was the book she liked best by me. Oh, something like that. <laughs> so I read this one poem. It's called The Inn of the Red Leaf. And it was about, I wrote it when I, in the 90s, when I, when the, it, uh, around the, after the death of Kathy Acker, the novelist. And it begins, I just copied out Robert Duncan's poem, his translation of Sonnet 3 from Dante's, uh, Dante's sixth sonnet. And if you know this poem by Duncan, well, here you get to hear it again. Rob, it's uh, in it, and he imagines himself, Jack Spicer and Robin Blazer, as living in, in like a kind of artist paradise. Robin, it would be a great thing if you, me, and Jack Spicer were taken up in a sorcery with our mortal heads so turned that life dimmed in the light of that fairy ship, the golden vanity or the revolving roar, whose sails ride before music as if it were our will, having no memory of ourselves, but the poets we were in certain verses that had such a semblance or charm, our lusts and loves confused in one, lord or magician of amor's likeness, and that we might have ever at our call those youth we have celebrated to play eros and erased to lament in the passing of things and to weave themes forever of love and that each might be glad to be so far abroad from what he was. And this is where I begin. And I was watching this film by Argento, The End of the Red Leaf, which is a terrible like inquisition type. Bring in the prisoner in black and white telephones, shackles. He will tell what he knows of the red inn of the red leaf, if I am a judge of men. Is it in Canada? Is that all you can tell us, prisoner of the black jail in Milan winter? My tongue torn away by plants emits a wig and wag. That's all. Say fini. The inn of the red leaf. Slap his face, make him cough up in blood. More details. Not just, it's in Canada. Do you think us fools? <laughs> in the winter of my 45th year, I was on the phone with Dodie, and she said Kathy Acker was very sick. 
the whitewashed walls of the police state office and the sweat of the prisoner talking without crosses, supported in the chair and thinking these thoughts with no direction. Who went to Venice? The icy banks of the canal. Who went to Tijuana on the wings of a snow white dove? Kathy's last days were spent in a, all over the world trying to find help for her cancer. Now you see her, now you don't. Aora la mira, y ahora no. Waiter, check into the inn of the red leaf. Accommodate party of large egos with utmost civility. On New Year's Eve, I'm sitting here thinking, where is she now? Dodie, I would like it if you and I and Kathy Acker were all still alive through some Jamaican voodoo herb and our Filipino healer put us on the ferry boat just like pussy came with the pirates, but with less pressure. A big ship with a white sail that thrills to loud music, and we could not remember who had written what and who had stolen what passage from another. Our lusts and loves confused as one, like Harold Robbins filibustering with red face in UK courtroom. And I'd like it if all the fellows we ever loved and been dominated by before pirate advent. And the men who died so that we could live and sail, kind of, you know, were like the slave boys. And I'd smile to you, and you and she at me, to be on this funny sea, this choppy, cool, violet water. Mm -hmm. Now I'll go to Action Kylie, I'm just jumping right through my whole career. <laughs> There's so many sad poems in here too that I want to bright, bright, brighten up a little bit. Well, I'll read anagrams then. That's always fun. Do you know how anagrams? <laughs> Online guy, Neil Young. <laughs> Canterbury Tales, Rusty Tabernacle. <laughs> Marcel Proust, Corrupt Males. <laughs> Kylie Minogue, I like them young. <laughs> no real harm, no real charm beneath Helena Bonham Carter. <laughs> Michael Keaton, the coke animal. <laughs> Julia Roberts, bestial juror. <laughs> a really sublime twit. And then there's a second anagram. Wait, I'm really subtle. William Butler Yeats. <laughs> Revenge is our way, Sigourney Weaver. <laughs> Erotica villainous. Alicia Silverstone. <laughs> Andy McDowell, a wild old menace. <laughs> no brains on a date? Come on. <laughs> Antonio Banderas. <laughs> <laughs> so thinking, I brought my, these little books. So every Christmas I write a, my, a, my birthday, I make a book of all my little poems. <laughs> Sad, <isn't it? laughs> I wasn't really sure what to read, but I I had some good ones in it. This one is called Story of Lincoln. Did you you know that magazine Abraham Lincoln and the editor asked me to write something for him, so I wrote him. I didn't know how to do this farf thing, so I was. <laughs> I wrote the story of Abraham, and that was kind of a pastiche of a Nico song, like All Tomorrow's Parties. <laughs> it means like this drumming, you know, organ beat to really get it across. To him. And then story of Lincoln, and this was the day when Lincoln was, you know, declared he was gay. And what right have you to comment? on my choosing to love the person I set my heart on. Just because you and Ross have gone on record as stating that heterosexuality is not of interest in the human community, 
I was the law partner of the man you think so little of, and he, Lincoln, deserves the respect you would give to any other black-clad human of a species, be he gay or straight. And you, as you're in your high-toned, two-color Surrey of the month with the lampshade fringe <laughs> bobbing at five miles an hour, you do not know what went down on those long, frary nights in the world's largest bed, in the world's tiniest log cabin, rest <laughs> in Springfield. I used to say to him, Lincoln, speak low, for the snows have ears. <laughs> and he would josh me, reminding me that my name was Speed. And my, do you know the, the, the root famous roommate of Lincoln, James Speed Herndon? My name was Speed and my mind was made of crystal. No two flakes the same. So I couldn't say whether Democrats crouched be between the floorboards to let in their ears. I would see those little fleshy excrescences like toadstools growing between the boards or bumping up the broad loom rug. And to me, I saw ears, the ears of dying henchmen. For Lincoln and I were free of ambition at night, other than arranged to know what an Illinois body tastes like with whiskey dripped on its increscences. However, <laughs> not you, and not Ross. This was the debate in the house, if I had had a drop to drink in Springfield. For thine was the mischief and the slander and the abuse of ancestral privilege. We were roommates, cabin mates, nothing more. But in the 19th century, we sailed an earthbound Pequod. And that night, we were not divided. I had had but one notion of the years from the time I woke on the prairie, unwanted spawn of widower speed, the flat lands oppressing my mind, that someday I would see the mountains and the ends of the sea, and in the body of Lincoln I found me both Canaan's. Pity you stooped with your pickup ears, hearth crickets, to abys abysm me in your idea of Shane, be he gay or straight, he was the map of the territory, the copy that, in the years to come, would precede the original, so that now, to reproduce my state of mind, I cross my legs in yoga position, <laughs> balancing Lincoln Penny on warm, firm head of Dick. <laughs> he has not failed me, and you simply lack the right to judge. If you had been in that bed, you might not be so treasony and needy. You are a toothless son of man, and I, lawyer speed, have felt the snowflakes melt in my open furnace of rectum. <laughs> and I'm reading a little bit from um, same time last year which I wrote for Kota Ozawa. He was doing a, like an animated version of Last Year at Marienbad, and I was urging him to watch this movie, same time next year, with Ellen Burstyn. Before your time. <laughs> so it just goes on from that premise that the two movies are really the same picture. <laughs> okay, this one is about Wuthering Heights by Kate Bush. Does any of you know? Okay. <laughs> It's me, you're Kathy, I'm coming home now. It's so cold, let me into your window. Oh. I was only a boy when Kate Bush made that song a hit, and I fell in love with her gaudy Lindsay Kemp interpretive dance skills. The way her long arms would wrap around her own ribcage, hugging herself as she zigzagged like a pharaoh across a field of barley. Poplars swaying behind her, her flame-colored dress or pantsuit, like a, a blazing provocation, hugging herself as though, like Heathcliff, she had been cast out of society for some unnamed offense related to her fabulousness. <laughs> And she sang the words, let me in at your window. She raised a pale hand and covered her face with it. Then let the hand slide so that the face seemed to be approaching a window pane. You know, let me in at your window. <laughs> Pressing its nose into it in mute appeal, longing for the warmth inside of family life. 
yet forever cut off of it from it because of her red dress, her orangey <laughs> red dress, like a flamingo. It's me, your Kathy. She would mispronounce her own name, <laughs> placing heavy accent on the second syllable of Kathy, making it sound like Kathy, <laughs> as if to say, I don't even care what I call myself. I'm beyond, I am beyond names, I am need. 